The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Powermatic, the gold standard since 1921. And by Rockler Woodworking and Hardware. Create with confidence. If you've been to the website recently, or if you follow me on Twitter, Facebook, or Google+, you've already heard the good news. Our son, Mateo Xavier, was born on October 28th. Now, the little guy came just a bit early, about seven weeks, so we've been going back and forth to the hospital. But the good news is, he's doing great. At this point, we really just need to fatten him up, and then we can bring the little guy home. Uh, Nicole, she's doing fantastic. She's home resting right now in her little mommy sanctuary that I put together for her. Um, and frankly, we're just thrilled. Things happened a little sooner than we expected, but we're plowing forward and everything is going really, really well. So I figured, you know, I'm a new dad. What should I do with my spare time? Of course, I'm gonna build a calendar frame, duh. Now this project was specifically requested by Nicole. Here's her old calendar frame. This one has been with us for quite a while. In fact, it's got about four layers of paint on it. I think it's been brown, green, and of course now it's white. Uh, this one in particular, it's okay, but the problem is you have to take it off the wall every month when you want to change the calendar. Uh, you basically slide this thing out through the top like so change the month and drop it back in. But again, that means every month you're taking it off the wall to make the change. So I think we can really improve on that design by having something that loads in the front. Instead of having to take it off, you just slide it up, in, and down. So that's really our primary goal. The frame itself is going to be fairly basic. I don't think it needs to be super ornate, but you certainly could add a lot of decorative elements to it if you choose to. So it's going to be a very adaptable design. Now, calendars are not exactly created equal. There's a couple different types, and we're gonna build ours specifically for a certain size calendar. So just keep that in mind with the dimensions. You may wanna change things a little bit. In fact, I have two calendars here to show you an example of what the different sizes might be. Now, aside from being the coolest calendar ever, this one is what I would call your everyday calendar. You've got a 12 inch width here, and it's also 12 inches high. So of course, when you open this completely, you're looking at 12 by 24. So you want to make sure that when you build your frame, you account for this size calendar if this is the type you want to use. Now this is a little bit more of a, I guess you could call it a premium calendar. It's certainly more expensive, but the width is just a little bit wider at 13 and a half inches wide. The height is still 12 inches, so when it's unfolded, it's going to be 24. So 13 and a half by 24, and that's the dimensions that we're going to use to build our frame today. One of the great things about this project is the fact that it doesn't require much in the way of material. I guarantee if you go to your scrap bin, you probably have enough stock there to make at least one of these. Now, I highly recommend that you don't make just one. Try to make about four or five. This is one of those projects that really lends itself well to the batching process, where if you're making one, you may as well make multiples because it won't take much longer. Once those machines are set up, you just pass four or five pieces through, and when it's all said and done, you've got a number of these to give out. And I guarantee you, as soon as you give one of these as a gift, you're gonna get the request. So you may as well have some here waiting when those requests come. Now, the boards that I have here are pretty special. This is some stock that I got from our buddy Chad Muterspall at Muterspall Lumber. This is a curly maple board. It's nice and wide, and the stock for this project is fairly narrow, so I'm still gonna have a decent amount of width left in this board that I can use for something else in the future. But for this project, this curl that's in here is gonna be absolutely stunning. So I'm really excited to see how that comes out. The second one I'm gonna make is using this material. This is actually quarter sawn white oak but it's not your average quarter sawn white oak. I mean, it's got the ray flex in it, which we expect to see, but it also has curl. This is something that I haven't really seen much before, and I certainly haven't ever worked with it before, so I am really excited to see how this turns out. Really some special boards here. And this is one of those projects where the project itself is not super complicated necessarily, it's not real complex, but it is special. And the reason is because I'm giving one to my mom and I'm giving one to my wife, the two most special women in my life. So of course they deserve some of the best stock that I have in my shop right now. So enough with the mushiness, uh, let's get into milling some lumber and we'll start building our calendar frame. To make our frame, we'll need two pieces cut to 26 and three quarters of an inch long by one inch wide by three quarters of an inch thick for the sides. One piece cut to 15 inches long, two and a half inches wide, and three quarters of an inch thick for the top. And one piece cut to 15 inches long, 
one and a quarter inches wide, and three quarters of an inch thick for the bottom. I need to cut my wide maple board down a bit, so I start by milling one edge at the joiner. I then use the clean edge for a rip cut at the bandsaw. These days, I'm using my bandsaw more and more for rips just because it feels much safer than the table saw. With my parts laid out on the board, I can now cut everything down to a more manageable size and follow through with the full milling process. Rough cutting to length, jointing the faces, and jointing the edges. At the table saw, I rip the parts out of my wider board, leaving them a little bit oversized. On skinnier work pieces like this, ripping can sometimes cause a little bit of warping. So I make a quick trip back to the joiner to correct any issues, and then it's back to the table saw again to rip each piece to final width. Finally, the planer and drum sander bring my pieces to final thickness. The only thing left to do now is use the crosscut sled to cut the pieces to final length. Cut the side pieces together to ensure they're exactly the same length, and use a stop block for the top and bottom pieces to make sure that they're also the same length. I think it's important to show safety issues as they happen, so here's some footage that would end up on the cutting room floor of a regular woodworking show. While jointing one of my side pieces, I hit a little snag and the piece would not budge. My first instinct was to stop and see if I could knock it loose with a light tap at the front of the piece. No luck. A quick nudge at the back of the piece? Nope. So I held the piece securely in place until the blades came to a complete stop. While I don't think tapping the piece was really the right thing to do, turning the machine off was. In the heat of the moment, we sometimes make decisions that could land us in hot water. So in most cases on tools like the table saw and the jointer, when a piece becomes stuck, don't force it. Just hold it in place and turn the machine off. Wait for the blades to stop and then analyze why it happened in the first place and correct it. The primary joinery for this project is going to be the half lap. Now half laps are deceivingly strong. They seem so simple that you can't imagine them having a whole lot of strength. But when these two pieces come together, what you have is a lot of glue surface. That glue surface, long grain to long grain contact, means that that joint is incredibly strong. And in fact, when this frame is glued up, uh, the only way you're getting those pieces apart is if you break the frame. The wood is gonna give up before that joint does. So it's certainly strong enough for a calendar frame. Now, there are a few different ways that you can make half laps, including the bandsaw, the table saw, and certainly hand tools will do the trick. But today I think I'm gonna focus on the router and specifically the router table. Because when you're dealing with small parts like this, it's much easier to take them to the table rather than try to take the router itself to these tiny little parts. So let's head over to the router table. I'll show you a few tricks for setting things up. And hopefully when it's all said and done, you'll know how to make perfect half laps. Now the setup at the router table is really straightforward. You'd basically just need your router table, a nice reliable fence and a straight bit. Now the bit that I'm using here is a spiral bit and I find that the spiral bits cut a little bit easier and they also leave a cleaner cut which when you're making joinery is really important. Uh, the only other thing I'll recommend that you add to your arsenal here is a square piece of plywood or scrap wood. Basically you just want to make sure that your ends are nice and square. This is going to support the work as you push it through the bit and it's going to make the cuts a lot safer but we'll get to all of that in a minute. So now let's talk a little bit about the dimensions and what we need to set up. Well, first of all, the fence position. We know that that's something we're going to need to vary, uh, but there is one dimension here, which is the bit height that's consistent for this entire set of half laps because our work pieces are all three quarters of an inch thick. So the bit height needs to be three eighths of an inch. So what I suggest you do is take a few pieces of scrap and hopefully, like on all projects, you take a couple pieces of scrap with you through the entire process so that those are the same exact thickness as your actual work pieces. And you could run those over the bit until you get an exact perfect half lap. Once you have it, lock it down, and now the only dimension you have to worry about is the one that pertains to the fence's position. 
Now that one depends on which half lap we're cutting, so you might need to move it a couple times, but I'll show you the process, it's the same for each one of them. The first half lap I'm going to set up for is the one we're going to put in our top and bottom pieces. What that calls for is a one inch edge to shoulder distance. So I need to make sure that my bit is located an inch from the fence. So I have my fence nice and loose here. And when you're really trying to, I guess you can call it micro adjust here, I find it easier to get pretty close, lock one side down, and then you only have to pivot on one side. And that looks pretty darn good. Lock it down. And now we could take our workpiece and start making our actual cuts. Now keep in mind that is quite a bit of material to remove in one shot, so you're going to want to take light passes at first and work your way back to the shoulder. But this is where this block of material here really comes in handy. It's going to do a couple of things. It's going to keep us nice and secure, because obviously if we were trying to, to run this piece across the bit, well, that would be pretty darn dangerous. So having this backer material here keeps us nice and straight and we can actually have a real good secure push over the router bit. The other thing is, whenever you're doing an operation like this, you will no doubt get some blowout and tear out here on the back. So having a nice smooth backer with a nice tight fit right up against it will ensure that we get a nice clean cut on the back end of the routing operation. All right, so let's fire up the router and start making our half laps. That looks pretty darn good. And this is one of the reasons why I like to use a router for this, is because you get a nice clean face. It's gonna be great as a glue surface. Now, if you wanna double check yourself, you can always go to one of your side pieces, which is what this will eventually join up to, and you could push it right up against the shoulder and feel with your finger how close you came. If that's perfectly flush, you know you're dead on. And if it's not, you could just move your fence a hair to adjust one way or the other, okay? But even if it is slightly off, it's nothing that a little bit of sanding or a couple of strokes with a hand plane wouldn't take care of. That's looking pretty good. Now just a quick tip, if you have an underpowered router or maybe you're just working with a really dense hardwood, you may want to do something like this, where you've gone to the table saw and nibbled away some of the stock here so that the bulk of it is gone. This actually reduces the stress on the bit tremendously. So you can see I've got a lot of it removed already, I just need to make the finishing passes with the router bit. Uh, now, I mean, if you're doing this much work, you may as well just put the dado stack in and make these at the table saw, but there are certain operations where removing the stock like this will come in really handy if you really do need to use the router for a particular operation. So that really does it for our top and bottom half laps. Now we have to do the sides. The sides are a little bit of a different story because they do not get the same half lap on both ends like we just did for our top and bottom pieces. The reason is because the bottom portion of our side piece connects to the bottom piece, which is much more narrow than our top piece. All right, so you have to keep that in mind as you make those cuts. So we'll do one at a time. We'll set up for the bottom one first. That one's going to be an inch and a quarter. And then we set up for the top one at two inches. And once that routing is done, it's probably not a bad idea to do a little dry assembly. Now I like to call these dry assemblies uh, sanity checks because basically they help to show you errors that you might otherwise miss. Uh, if you don't check this type of stuff, put the half laps together. Everything looks nice and tight. Should be square if our joints are square. You could certainly double check at this point if you wanted to. Uh, one thing I wanna show you here is at the top. 
Now you might look at this and think, uh oh, Mark made a mistake, which can and will happen, by the way. If you've watched the show long enough, you know what I'm talking about. This actually is going to be a flat here. We're gonna remove some of this stock and then we're gonna have a nice gentle curve at the top. But that curve terminates right here at this point and flattens out. So we'll be able to remove this stock later on when we give our top that curve uh, for a decorative effect. So um, this really is supposed to be two inches even though our top workpiece right now is two and a half inches. Just wanna make sure you understand why that looks the way it does. Now pretty much like any other frame, whether it's a door frame or a picture frame, we need to create grooves or rabbits on the back ends of these pieces so that our calendar has a place to go and then we need to put a backer board on top of that. And you want your backer board to fit nice and flush on the back. So in order to do that, we have to basically create two rabbits on each piece, one a little deeper than the other. So doing this, you know, there's a bunch of different ways you could accomplish it, but again, trying to keep things as simple as possible, I'm just gonna use pretty much the same setup at the router table with my half inch bit. Now before we do that, some of these cuts are not gonna go all the way through the workpiece. They're gonna be stopped cuts. So we need to prepare for that by putting marks on the workpieces that tell us when to lift off the bit and when to go into the bit. And this way we won't cut through and have an exposed hole when that frame is glued together. So let's start marking these pieces up. Since our narrow side pieces are really the easiest ones because they get through grooves all the way down, let's do those first. Basically, you wanna flip the piece over because we wanna work on this inside edge here. This is where the calendar is gonna sit, right? So if you flip it over this way, our first rabbit is gonna be located 5 16 of an inch in from the edge. You just draw that line all the way down. Our next rabbit is gonna be located a quarter inch in further from that line. So that's a total of 9 16 from the edge. Now the only other thing we need to worry about here is how deep that router bit is gonna cut. In the case of this outer rabbit, this is really what I'm gonna call the calendar rabbit, it needs to go 3 8 of an inch deep, so it, you really want it to be flush with the surface of this half lap material here. The second rabbit is a little bit more shallow. Really, this needs to go as deep as your backing material's thickness. So if you have exactly an eighth of an inch, you wanna go down an eighth of an inch. Uh, if you're a little bit under, you wanna make sure you make note of that so you don't cut it too deep. But we'll take another measurement later with the actual material just to make sure that we get this perfect. And just for further clarification, I just kinda of shaded in the profile here so you can see the material we're gonna be removing. Now for our bottom piece, things do get a little bit trickier because we can't necessarily plow that rabbit all the way through. If we do, look what's gonna happen. If you go all the way through this edge on the outside of the frame, we would see an exposed gap here, right? Obviously that's not gonna look very good. So in order to prevent that from happening, we need to create stopped rabbits that don't go all the way through. So it's important to know not only how deep to cut in with the bit, but where we need to stop. All right, so that's gonna be a major part of what we're marking here. Everything I need to mark here is on the bottom inside edge of our bottom piece. So it's much easier if I flip it over this way and put my marks here. Just wanna make sure you have the orientation straight. Now the calendar groove on this one goes in a quarter inch. So I've got my adjustable set and I'm just gonna mark a quarter inch in. And our back panel rabbit is a quarter inch further in from that. So that's a total of a half inch from the edge. Draw that one in. Right. So now it's imperative that we create some border lines here just for reference that tell us where to stop routing. Um, so you can measure in from the edge here. If you're looking at the calendar rabbit, that guy is gonna be in uh, 11 16 from the edge. All right, so there's our 11 16 line. Do not pass this line. For the back panel rabbit, that one is located in 7 16 right, So also, do not pass this line. Now, you can give yourself a little bit of a reality check here if you take one of your pre-marked side pieces and bring it in, and let's see how these two lay out. The calendar groove just about meets up perfectly, and the back panel groove is pretty much in line with this stopping point here. So here's the key, when we do this routing, we're gonna stop ahead of this line because once this is all glued together, we can always come back and chisel this little edge here to make it nice and even. So don't stress about it too much. It's more important that we stay away from that line uh, versus actually getting right up on it. 
And at this point, we don't really need to mark how deep these are going to go because they're all, all the pieces are going to be the same. The calendar groove will be 3 eighths and the back panel groove will be 1 eighth. And finally, our top piece is really going to be one of the more difficult ones to route because we have a lot more material to remove. That's going to give us enough headroom to allow our calendar to slide up and go into the groove and then slide back down. So in order to create that clearance, we need to have the proper sized wide rabbit here. So the calendar rabbit itself is going to be three quarters of an inch in from the edge. So we can mark that up real quick. And our back panel rabbit is going to be located in an inch from the edge. It's a quarter inch further than the calendar rabbit. And of course our routing stop points follow the same rule that we used for our bottom piece. Now for both the top and bottom piece, remember we have that start and stop point, so we need to be able to see that start and stop point because although I put all my marks here, this side is going to be down during the routing operation. I won't necessarily be able to see those start and stop points. So it's really important that we take those marks and we just transfer them onto the side and then again onto the top. And even if it's here in the half lap, that's okay. That's still going to be a reference for us to know that it's time to pull the workpiece away because we're getting too close to the bit. All right? So just make sure those marks wrap all the way around. Now if you're lucky, you haven't touched your setup from when you made your half laps, which means your bit is already set at 3 eighths of an inch. Well that's perfect because the first set of rabbits we need to make are 3 eighths of an inch deep. We cut into the material 3 eighths of an inch. So just keep that where it is. And generally speaking, I try to minimize adjustments on my router table as much as possible. So while this guy is set at 3 eighths, I'm going to do all of the cuts that I need that setting for. The only thing we'll be varying at that point is the fence distance. So whenever we change to a new piece, we're going to have to change our fence location. But that's perfectly fine. That's not going to really hurt anything. Now here's a quick tip for you. When you're setting up your router fence, especially in a situation where we need to know where that bit starts and stops, you can actually use your fence to help you line things up. Now this is not super accurate, but the good thing is I need to keep away from this line. So I could certainly make sure that if my line is even with this side of my fence, and I know that that side of my fence is pretty close to the edge of this bit, I could be pretty confident that once I plunge in, I'm going to be a reasonable distance from my line. But you can actually use the fence itself without placing any marks or tape or anything here to tell you where your start and stop points are. Now I want to take a second to explain exactly how this operation takes place because you could see it done a hundred times but until you do it yourself and you really understand the mechanics of what's going on it can be pretty scary. Now first of all let me mention I was using my hands because I want you to be able to see what I'm doing and where those start and stop points are. But here's how I would really handle this if there was no camera around which is a little counterintuitive since I'm supposed to show you the safest way possible but there is a little bit of a method to my madness here. I like to use push blocks like this because they keep my hands out of the way. You have to keep it back far enough so you can still see your lines. But if I had these here, the camera would never be able to see it all. So the technique really involves pivoting. You want to make sure you have full contact with the outfeed side of the fence first before you start to bring it into the bit. And once it makes contact with that bit, if you push the piece forward at all, once you're in contact with that bit, you are most likely going to have a missile on your hands. So you want to make sure you're very slow and deliberate about your movements. Start with the point here and then slowly, see how I just moved forward like that? That would have been a problem with bit contact. So you want to make sure your line is where you want it to be, right about here, and then pivot into the bit, make contact, and then you start pushing forward this way. All right, till the very end, and then you pull it off again. So pretty straightforward, but these push blocks will really give you a good amount of control and that pivot is absolutely essential to making sure this is a nice and safe cut. Now the top piece is routed pretty much in the exact same way as the bottom piece using our pivoting start and stop operation. We're just going to move the fence back in increments of maybe an eighth of an inch or maybe a little bit more. So it's going to take a few passes because this cut, this initial cut here for the calendar rabbit is three quarters of an inch back. So when it's all said and done, our bit from the front 
to the fence, that distance should be three quarters of an inch. We're just gonna take our time getting there. Now on those last few passes, you really need to be careful because the distance between the bit and the fence is pretty far, so it's a little harder to pivot that piece in. And you see I actually deviate from my line quite a bit here. But again, this is nothing that uh, we can't just fix later with a chisel and a hammer. So there's just no reason to take any risks here. Fortunately, our side pieces are absolute cake because you can just go all the way through. There's no pulling the piece away from the fence. All I need to do is just take it in a couple of steps, working my way back to five sixteenths. Now before I cut all my back panel rabbits, I've got to lower my bit to about an eighth of an inch, just under an eighth of an inch in fact. Now I'm just going to do a test run at this setting just to make sure it fits. So I've got a piece of scrap here, just going to run it over the bit and then test with my actual back piece material. All right, nice and flush. Now that the bit height is set, it's pretty much rinse and repeat. There's really no reason to show you each one of these pieces. We're just working back to our second pencil line here to create that second rabbit. Here's the good thing though. This is only up about an eighth of an inch. That's really not gonna stress the bit very much. So we don't necessarily need to work our way back step by step to get all of these done properly. We can go right to our line on the first shot. And this is pretty much what you're going for. On the next Wood Whisper, we'll add the front loading slot, cut the curve in the top, cut the pencil groove in the bottom, add our back panel, and finally assemble and finish our frame. You don't want to miss it.